I want to begin with a, a famous text in Luke's gospel, which sometimes we don't really think about this text much, but Jesus says this. Jesus says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that converts than over 99 righteous people who have no need of conversion. Well, you want to come to a full stop and say, whoa, does God love sinners better than righteous people? It would seem to say so. Jesus says God rejoices more over a sinner who converts than over 99 people who righteous people. So it would seem that God loves sinners more than God loves righteous people. Well, that's not what the text says. You know, this is a trick text. There are no righteous people. <laughs> okay. God loves, there, there's only sinners, and God loves sinners who admit that they're sinners. They're easier to love, you know. See, there's, there's more joy in heaven over a sinner who admits that he or she is a sinner. We're all sinners, you know. There have only been two people, we believe in our Christian tradition, who have ever walked this planet who never sinned, and that was Jesus and Mary. And everybody else falls short. I remember once when I was living in Toronto, the Catholic school board asked me if I could write a definition of what constitutes a practicing Catholic, which is an interesting thing. Remember we used to have that, a practicing Catholic, you went to Mass and so on. So I may not attempt some definition, but I said, first of all, only Jesus and Mary fit that description. Okay. <laughs> and the rest of us, precisely, we're still practicing. Okay. Um, you know, we're nobody. There are no whole people. There are no righteous people. You know, the... The most important, kind of the central part of St. Paul's teaching, okay, is the last thing he ever wrote when he was already in prison, sentenced to death and so on, he wrote the letter to the Romans, okay? And the letter to the Romans is kind of St. Paul's opus, you know? It's a dying man, disciple of Jesus, special disciple to the Gentiles. What does he want to tell us before he dies, okay? And it's really cha Romans chapter 1 to 8. And what Paul does in the first seven chapters of Romans is this. He basically tells us that nobody gets it right. And nobody has ever gotten it right. He said the Jews had the law and they couldn't obey it. The Gentiles knew the law from nature in their hearts. They couldn't obey it. Nobody got it right. And then he culminates in chapter 7 and said, and nobody can get it right. And that's that famous text where Paul says, Woe to me, wretch that I am. The good I want to do, I can't do. The evil I want to avoid, I end up doing. That's not a morbid text. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sensitive man who understands himself or a sensitive woman. See, we're never adequate. Now, it's interesting, Paul does that for a purpose because, of course, he's culminating, he's, gonna, he's working up to chapter 8. See, so he spends seven chapters telling us, you can't get your life right. And then he gives the thing in chapter, he said, because you don't have to. He said, because God is a merciful God and there's nothing. Remember that famous text? There, is, there aren't principalities, anything that can separate you from the love of Christ, including your own weakness. See, so his, his, his final testament to the Christian community is, you can't get your life right. That's the bad news. The good news is, you don't have to. You know, and he says, nobody's ever got it right, but it's okay. We're people of redemption. Incidentally, that is why in Christianity, in Christianity and in Judaism and in Islam, the Muslims, we're the only religions that don't believe in reincarnation. Everybody else believes in reincarnation, and the reason we don't believe in it, because we are, we all have the same God, Yahweh, Allah. It's actually the same God, okay? And, uh, but our God is a God of mercy and forgiveness. You don't have to get your life right. You know, see, if, if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, and those are wonderful spiritualities, but in order to go to heaven, you've got to keep coming back and back till you get it right. <laughs> now, some of us, you know, we're, we're on our seventh trip. And so on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Remember when you were a kid at school and the teacher, you had to say, you have to keep, keep you know, right until you can stay between the lines, and then you could pass on to the next lesson. Well, see, in every other religion, you have to get your life right. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you don't have to get your life right. You have to try, you know. 
But see, that's what we're, we're religions of redemption. You do what you can, and God does the rest. And the way God does the rest, he does it, or she, whatever God is, God does it with mercy. See, mercy fills in where we are inadequate, and we're all inadequate. Those of you who come from Protestant uh, churches and so on, and you'll have been schooled on this, and I like this line, went right back to Luther. See, classical Protestantism says, you never ask yourself, you know, am I a sinner? You only say, what's my sin? <laughs> and that's true. Is that all of us in this room, it's not a question, are we sinners? Are we weak? Where do we, where do we short circuit out? What are our weaknesses? There are no whole human beings. You know, today, we have what we call the literature of dysfunctionality. So this, and actually, it's very good. There's, there's a very rich literature out there about dysfunctional families, dysfunctional churches, family systems, dysfunctional organizations, dysfunctional churches, and so on. And, you know, and it's very good literature with one exception. It seems to give the impression that somewhere there are functional families, <laughs> that there are functional churches. There aren't any. You know, it's only a question of how bad is yours and how are you coping? You know, see, there are no whole people. There are no whole marriages. There are no perfect churches and so on. And we have good churches and good people and so on. See, we all stand in need of mercy. We don't get it right. I want to read you a famous quote from a, a German, she wasn't a theologian, she was a literature writer. Uh, but this is quoted in the famous Dutch Catechism. Those of you who remember back in 1966, the Dutch theologians, which, and these were major theologians, this was like Skillebex and Schoenenberg and Pete Franston and all these famous theologians, they, they put out a, a, what they call a new catechism. Those of you who are my age remember when we were schooled on the Baltimore Catechism, and it was good. They taught you doctrine. You know. Now they said, well, then we want the catechism that's existential. And so, um, but at one point they quote this text. They said, this, this is to understand yourself. It's from Anna Blyman. She says, um, at a certain point in my life, I realized that it's simply impossible for a human being to be and to remain good or pure. For instance, if I wanted to be attentive in one direction, it could only be at the cost of neglecting another. If I gave my heart to one thing, I left another in the cold. No day and no hour goes by without my feeling guilty about some inadequacy. We never do enough, and what we do is never well enough done, except being inadequate, which is what we're good at. <laughs> he said, because that is the way we're made. This is true of me, and it's true of everyone else. Every day and every hour brings with it its weight of moral guilt as regards my work and my relationships with others. I am constantly catching myself, catching myself out in my human failings, in spite of their being implied in my human imperfections. I am conscious of a sort of check, and this means that my human shortcomings are also my human guilt. It sounds strange, that we should be guilty where there's nothing we can do about it. But even where there is no purpose or deliberate intention, we have a conviction of our own shortcomings and of consequent guilt. A guilt which sometimes shows itself all too clearly in the consequences of what we have done or left undone. Now this isn't the morbid text. <laughs> this is a very sensitive human being. Um, you'd want her for your neighbor. <laughs> um, you know, she's in touch with herself. There isn't any unmerited self over self-confidence here. She says, you know, uh, it's not that she's beating herself up. She said, that this is St. This is Paul. This is Romans 7. He says, remember Paul says, woe to me, wretch that I am. The good I want to do, I often end up not doing. The evil I want to avoid, I often end up doing. I'll just bring that up. So we stand in need of God's mercy. Um, back to Jesus and Luke. Jesus says, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who admits they're a sinner than over 99 people who think they have no need of mercy. That's what that text could be translated as. Now, let's look at mercy. Um, I want to look at, the, I want to spend tonight, and, and maybe part of next week, depending on how far we get, looking at how mercy is defined in Scripture. You know, So notice I didn't go to dictionaries, 
I didn't go to psychological dictionaries and so on. Not that there isn't good literature there, but let's, how did the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures define it, and then how does Jesus define mercy and so on? And then we want to take that when we look at the year of mercy. What is mercy? Okay. I want to begin with um, a little bit of Old Testament background, and particularly the work of Walter Brueggemann, a wonderful Protestant scripture scholar, now retired. And those of you who remember back about 2002, Walter spoke here, um, actually spoke here twice. Um, so wonderful, he even looks like an Old Testament prophet. Okay, okay. <clears throat> but Brueggemann has done some, some, some very important work in the Old Testament. And, and now, this is, what I'm going to give, share with you has wider, wider implications than just mercy. He really poses something here. Brueggemann said, you know, if you, if you go to the, the Old Testament, we're going to also go to the New Testament afterwards, and you read it with this question in mind, whoever is writing this book, how did they understand the essence of religion? Okay, we're Christians in this room, you know. What's the essence of Christianity? What's the essence of any religion? What's the essence of, uh, of religion? Okay. Well, he said in the, in the Old Testament, you're going to find three answers, not one. Okay. Depends who's writing. Okay. And depends when they're writing. So Bergman said if you read the early books of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Numbers, you're going to see that at that point in Judaism, they understood the essence of religion as proper entry and proper practice. What made you a good Jew? Well, you had to be circumcised, you had to be born, you know, there had to be proper entrance or some kind of baptism, and you had to practice as a Jew. You know, you had to keep the Sabbath, you had to keep all these laws, and there's many laws. In fact, the Book of Numbers, they codify these laws, and it got right down to how you boil milk, and whether you can boil meat in milk and so on. What does a woman have to do when she's menstruating? And those rules, they get really minute at a certain point. And see, to be a good Jew, you have to belong to the Jewish community, and you have to obey all those rules, the major ones being the Ten Commandments. So if you asked a person in Deuteronomy, what makes you a good Jew? They would have said, proper entry, proper practice. I practice the law. I keep the law. So it was a person of keeping law, proper church practice. Now that held sway until the prophets came along. So the great prophets come along and they completely blow this out of the water. Okay, so the prophets come along, they say, you know something? God doesn't care about how you boil milk. <laughs> and God couldn't care about all this stuff and kosher and so on. They said, you know what God cares about? They said, God cares about the poor. And that's where you get this first powerful justice motif. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, they come out and say, God is a God for the poor. And proper religious practice is taking care of the poor. In fact, they have a mantra, which is still worth memorizing. The prophet says, the quality of your faith is going to be judged by the quality of justice in the land. And the quality of justice in the land will always be judged by how three, the three weakest groups, widows, orphans, strangers. That's code in scripture. Widows, orphans, strangers. That's the three weakest group in your society. When you come to the judgment day, you're going to be judged by how they fared when you were alive. Notice it. So you're going to be religiously judged by how the poor fare. That's the prophets, you know. Notice in there, they didn't seem to be concerned about whether you kept kosher and all this and so on. But that's not where the Old Testament ends. After the prophets come to wisdom figures, that's the Psalms and so on, the wisdom figures come along and say, you know what's more important than church practice? And you know what's more important than taking care of the poor? How you do it. And they said, the essence of religion is to have a wise, merciful heart. See, they insert the word mercy. You know what God wants from you? God wants from you to have a wise, merciful heart. Then you'll do proper church practice, and you'll take care of the poor, and so on. See, so, so the essence, see, incidentally, this still works today. You know, in, in all churches today, we have three kinds of Christians. We have Deuteronomy Christians, and they're convinced that the most important thing is proper church practice. Are you going to church? Are you keeping the rules? And so on. We have uh, prophetic Christians who they think the most important thing is justice, justice, justice. And we have wisdom Catholics. And these are the Thomas Keatings and the, so on. They say, 
meditation, prayer, <laughs> so on. You know, and oftentimes, ironically, those three people, a lot of times they don't get along. <laughs> no, in all churches, there's great tension between these three. That's true. In the Catholic Church today, in Protestant churches, there's, there's a huge tension between these three, you know. And it's true in all churches, in religion and so on. Um, it's true in Islam, it's true in Jude Judaism and so on. Um, but see, that tension is already clear in the Old Testament. For some Old Testament people, to be a, the essence of religion is proper practice. For some, it's taking care of the poor. And for others, it is um, to have a wise, compassionate heart. When, those of you who pray the Psalms, okay, and uh, is that up there? Yeah. Um, th those of you who pray the Psalms, um, somehow I missed something here. Okay. Yeah, it's on the bottom. Okay. Um, you know, you know how often this comes up, and it, it, it's translated in different ways in the English scriptures, where they say. I, want, I don't want sacrifice, I want mercy. Or I don't want sacrifice, I want compassion. And, and the Hebrew word there is the word hesed. And, uh, and it's, it's, it, it, there's an interesting background to that word, you know. Hesed was a word they used for family relationships. And it, it, it was a relationship that went beyond justice. So let me give you a simple example. Imagine you owe your banker, you owe your bank $200, okay? That's a relationship of justice, and the banker is not going to forgive you, okay? If you owe your brother or your sister $200, they might say, this is a seed inside the family, write it off. <laughs> see, see, so you don't, you don't keep justice books inside of a family, you know? And God said, that's what I want from you. You know, I want you to uh, relate to each other as brothers and sisters in which the rules of economic justice and payback and revenge, they don't apply, you know. Inside of families, you forgive, you forget, you let go, and so on. And so they use that word hasid, the word for mercy. Okay, now, we have this tension in the Old Testament. Jesus comes along. What does Jesus do with that? Well, what he, Jesus does what he does with everything else. He makes it infinitely more complex yet. <laughs> so he ratifies all three, you know. Um, you know, if, if <laughs> little footnote, if you're going to Jesus for, for easy answers, you haven't discovered Jesus. <laughs> you know, I was at a talk this summer in Toronto by Young Shade and Claire Bo Claiborne, whom we're trying to get here for our summer institute. And he's this wonderful young evangelical who works with the poor in uh, the streets of Philadelphia, but worked with Mother Teresa for lots of years. And he, he began his lecture this way. He said, you know, I always read these stories of people who say, you know, my life was messed up. My whole life was messed up. He said, then I discovered Jesus. And now oh, my life is together. He said, I laugh. He said, my life was together. Then I discovered Jesus. <laughs> so, Jesus doesn't set your life together. Jesus messed it up. John Shea said he was teaching in Chicago one time. And this young Jesus person gave up and says, you know, Father said, H have you met Jesus Christ? And John said, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> okay. See, Jesus, remember Jesus said, I don't bring peace into the world, I bring fire, you know. See, so that, okay, now here, it's interesting, Jesus ratifies all three of these. So there's times in, in the gospel where Jesus says, if anybody loves me, they'll keep my word. I'll always give you one example of this. Funny. So Jesus says, religion is about proper practice. And the, the New Testament, John, the letter, the epistle of John says, if anybody says they love God but don't keep the commandments, John says, you're a liar. See, you can't be loving God and breaking the commandments. So Jesus says, well, the essence of religion is proper practice, except he comes along at different places and he says, the essence of religion is how you treat the poor. In fact, that text in Matthew 25 can be one of the most singly scary texts in all of Scripture. And that's the famous text. You know the text by heart where whatsoever you do, remember Whatsoever you do to least my brother, you do to me. But he was answering a question. And the question was, what is going to be the question at the final judgment? When you stand before God with the great test, what's the real test? What are you going to be questioned on at the final judgment? So he sets it up as a judgment scene. So Jesus says, this is the way the last judgment's going to work. The king's going to come out, set up a throne, and they're going to divide the people, sheep to the right, 
go to the left, and there's going to be one set of questions. Did you feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit prisoners, visit the sick? You say, well, what about church stuff? Did you go to church? What about the sixth commandment, sex? What about all this stuff? It isn't asked. He said there's going to be one set of questions. Did you feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty? It's Jesus. I always tell priests, you know, if you went on a, on a Sunday homily and preached it just the way it was taught, you'd be in the bishop's office Monday morning. <laughs> you know, when you say, when you die, you stand before God, it's only going to be one set of questions. And notice they're not catechetical questions, but it's a question. Did you feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked? Well, what about all this other stuff? At that point, he doesn't say anything. One student said, how did Jesus get away with that? I said, he didn't. They killed him. <laughs> <laughs> He, he wasn't called into the bishop's office, you know. Okay. Little, little story, a colleague of mine says, he likes preaching this priest, said, he always tells people, said, so Jesus says, you who did it, you come with me to the kingdom for everlasting happiness, and you who didn't, divide into small groups. Okay. <laughs> okay. Interesting, a little footnote in this. Notice that neither group knew what they were doing. The group who did it right didn't know what they were doing. Remember, they say, we didn't know we were doing it for you. Jesus said, it doesn't matter. You did it. And the group who didn't do it right said, had we known, <laughs> we would have done it. Doesn't matter. In Matthew's gospel, mature discipleship is not so much whether you consciously work for Jesus or whatever. It's are you doing it right? And one of the things is the justice thing. But now Jesus doesn't end there either. He comes along with his own wisdom sayings. And at key points of the gospel, we're going to look at this text later on tonight, where Jesus says, be compassionate as your heavenly Father is compassionate. You know, the deepest part of the gospel. Now, it's interesting, a little footnote here. Um, in some English Bibles, or not just in English Bibles, in Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark write it this way, where they say, Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's Luke who says, be compassionate as your heavenly father is compassionate. Now, it's actually the same concept, except here I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, we need some, some, some translation here. See, all of us in this room, I suspect, maybe, maybe not all of it, but everybody who grew up in a Western language, English, Spanish, French, whatever, and so on, um, see the software we think in is Greek. And see, so for us, the word perfection means Precisely, perfection means no blemishes. See, a perfect complexion has no blemishes. A perfect body would have no blemishes whatsoever. See, so a perfect moral life would have no blemishes. So if Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, if you understand that in the Greek sense, which we do, it's impossible to do. We cannot be perfect. Except the Bible wasn't written by Aristotle. If it was, that was what it would mean. It was written in Greek, but with Hebrew thought. And in Hebrew, the word perfection is synonymous with the word compassion. So that, in fact, Luke simply gives you the word. So, in fact, Jesus is not saying be perfect as your father is perfect. He says be compassionate the way your heavenly father is compassionate. Be merciful. And you see, that's the deep center of the gospel, you know. Be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. And we're going to tease that out afterwards. That's quite a line. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Um, let me say a little bit about that. No, notice what he's... Um, um, we, we oftentimes don't remember the subordinate clause. Jesus says, be merciful, be compassionate, and he doesn't say, as is defined in the Dictionary of Psychological Health. <laughs> or be compassionate the way Eric Fromm defines it or the way Rollo May defines it, or the way the encyclopedia defines it, and so on. He says, be compassionate the way your heavenly Father is compassionate. Then he's going to say one of the most stunning things in all of Scripture. He said, be compassionate the way your heavenly Father is compassionate, because God the Father lets his Son, the Son here is the Son in the sky, not the Son, Jesus. He said, God lets his Son shine on the bad as well as the good, the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Now, he's saying this. He says, you know the way God loves? God loves the way the sun shines. And the sun is completely non-discriminatory. 
When the sun shines, it shines on vegetables and weeds evenly. The sun doesn't say, you know, vegetables are good and weeds are bad. The sun just shines and the vegetables drink in the sun and the weeds drink in the sun. Jesus says, God just loves. And he loves bad people, he loves good people. God loves the saints in heaven and God loves the devils in hell. God loves Mary, the mother of Jesus, and God loves Lucifer and loves them evenly. Now they respond differently, <laughs> you know. And God's energy goes out. And some people use the energy of God for wonderful things, like Mother Teresa is going to be canonized this weekend. Some of them use it for the most horrific things that you can imagine. It's God's energy. See, God just shines, and God loves everybody evenly. God loves pro-life, and God loves pro-choice, and God loves both Hillary and Donald Trump, <laughs> and God loves Republicans and Democrats. And not only that, God says, and you have to too. Remember, be compassionate the way God is compassionate. Love the way God loves, and God loves everybody indiscriminately. He said, that's the task. And remember, Jesus is going to say, don't just love your friends. Don't just love good people. You've got to love your enemies. You've got to love bad people. I said that in a church once in Austin. And the guy stood up and said, that's the most wishy-washy thing I've ever heard in my life, you know? <laughs> I said, well, take it up with Jesus, okay? <laughs> because that's pretty clear in, in Scripture, you know? And it's, it's one of the incredible challenges of Scripture. You're going to see it. I don't want to try to tease some of this out tonight, like, Jesus stretches us further, to my mind, than any moral teacher, psychological teacher ever, you know. Um, remember, he said, it's not good enough just to love those who love you. It's not good enough just to love the Democrats and not the Republicans, the Republicans and not the Democrats. It's not good enough to love pro-life and not love pro-choice. It's not good enough to love Christians and not love Muslims. It's not good enough to love Muslims and not Hindus and everybody else. It's not good enough just to love good people. You've got to love bad people. And you see, you love them the same. No, you're going to see, that's one of the, the challenges, which is also why God can be merciful. <laughs> okay. But I want to conclude this little section here. See, so Jesus comes along, and he doesn't pick between these three. Jesus doesn't say, well, in the end, religion's about practice, or in the end, religion's about wisdom and compassion, or in the end, religion's about justice, and religion is about all three, you know? Um, join your prayer group, join your justice group, and join your church group. It's interesting. You know, that's what you see in great Christians. You know, um, Dorothy Day, who's going to be the first really American-born, um, canonized. Notice Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day could lead the rosary, and she could lead the peace march. Most people can't do it. <laughs> they can lead the peace march. They can't lead the rosary. Some people can lead the rosary. They can't lead the peace march. Some people can do this, but they can't do that. Jesus says, you want to try all three of these. You want to have proper practice. You want to keep the commandments. You want to feed the poor. You want to be a person of justice. And you want to be a person with a wise, compassionate, merciful heart. Okay. Now, this is a little background. I want to look at some gospel illustrations of this. Okay. And, and I've picked 12 of these. Um, just, just that, that, that acts that illustrate mercy, okay? And the first one, I'm just going to give to you as an image. I'm not going to dwell on it very long and so on. But it's that powerful gospel text of Luke 15. Um, see, Luke, Luke 15 has three parables in a row, okay? Uh, and all three of them make the same, um, and it's really the chapter of mercy. If you want to pull one chapter out of the entire New Testament, this is the chapter of mercy, Take Luke 15, okay. And these are the three, three parables. Jesus says, no. <clears throat> what shepherd, if he has 99, 100 sheep, and if he loses one, doesn't leave the 99 in the desert, in the wilderness. Now notice he's not leaving them in a very good place, you know, and goes and he finds the stray. And when he finds the stray, he brings it back on his shoulder. He said, because there's more rejoicing in heaven over one, stray that's brought back, then over 99 who don't need repentance. Okay. Then the second parable, he said, there's a woman with 10 coins, and she loses a coin. And we're going to look at that story in some detail later. And she goes ballistic, looking for this coin. She's lost this dime. 
coin's only worth a dime, you know. She sweeps the house, puts on lamps, and eventually she finds the coin. She's so overjoyed that she throws a party and calls in all her neighbors, and that's this huge party, probably spend more than all ten coins are worth because she found her lost coin. And then the famous parable that gets most of the ink, a father had two sons. And the younger son took his inheritance, went off to a foreign land, spent it on prostitutes and drinking and so on, then fell on hard times. He comes back, and the father runs out to meet him. Notice the son doesn't even get a chance to give his, 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 his apology speech, embraces him, said, get the best slippers, the best robe, kill the fattest calf, put the ring on his finger. It's going to be a feast. My son has come back. And then the older son is in the field. He hears this. He comes home, and he's angry. He's angry because the fuss now is about the younger son, and he won't go in the house, but the father comes out, and he begs the son to come in the house. Incidentally, if you understand Jewish literature and Jewish scriptures, that is where Jesus really, um, it's surprising for Jewish authors. See, if you read the Old Testament, there are so many stories where the younger one gets it and the older one just is shuttled off. You know, it starts with Abraham between Isaac and the other son. Isaac gets the inheritance. The other son's Rachel and, 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 uh, and Leah. You know, Jacob falls in love with, with Rachel. He dumps Leah. <laughs> you know, and see, and they never get back to the younger one, you know. Um, see, here, in, in, in classical Jewish religious literature, the, the father wouldn't have come out for the older son. It's all about the younger son. But here, no, Jesus... It's both sons. See, he's a father. He's got to get both kids in the house. You know, the woman, you know, um, let me do just a little symbolism on that. See, no, notice the numbers in there, you know. He said, somebody has 100 sheep and they lose one. They leave the 99 and go after the one. That's not very wise to do. Notice you are rolling the dice on, a, on 99 <laughs> for the sake of the one. See, that, that, that wouldn't be very prudential. You could lose all 99 getting the one. But th th this is the deal. It's to do with numbers and wholeness. In Judaism, 100 is a whole number. And 99 is not a whole number. And so that, uh, see, it's not so much the value of the one sheep, it's the value of wholeness. This, this shepherd, he's got to get everybody together. And it's the same with the woman at the 10 coins. The dime isn't worth much, but 10 is a whole number and 9 is not. I once heard a wonderful homily by John Shea on this. John Shea says, you know, you could recast that story of the woman. He says, you could cast it this way. There was a mother who had 10 children, and it was Thanksgiving. And nine of the kids were home at the table, and they were enjoying themselves. But the mother was conscious that one wasn't home. <laughs> and she's hovering around the telephone hoping this kid would ring. or the, And then, you know, halfway through the meal, the wayward daughter isn't home. She rings the mother, and then they talk a little bit. Then the mother comes. Now she can celebrate. No, it's whole. See, a family isn't whole if there's somebody missing. And the same with the father. See, he has two sons. He's trying to get them both in the house, okay? And the house represents heaven. He's trying to get him into the father's home. And finally, he gets one in, and he's outside... <laughs> Begging the other one, see, the family has to be whole. So that, um, but, but, and it's, it's to do with mercy. And rolling the dice for mercy. So Luke 15, it's, it's the preeminent chapter of mercy in scripture. Okay. And we're, we're, we're all familiar with that, that, just that powerful image of the prodigal son. Um, which incidentally, scripture scholars say, you shouldn't call that the parable of the prodigal son. It should be called the parable of the prodigal father. See, it's the father who's really prodigal. You know, he, he, that's not the way a father should act. You know, he threw away his dignity, his money, everything out of mercy and love for the son. See, so it's, it's, this is really a story about God. And, and those of you, if you haven't seen it or read the book, uh, look at that famous painting by Rembrandt, you know, and uh, which Henry now wrote that incredible book on called The Return of the Prodigal Son. See, so this is ultimately a story about God and God's mercy, not so much about the two boys who are, you know, one is out of the house out of weakness, one is out of the house out of anger, they're both out of the house. But the story is about the father, the father trying to get his children into the house. 
the woman with the coins is a mother trying to get her kids to come home. You know, it's a shepherd trying to keep the flock together. Okay? See, that's that powerful thing in Luke 15. Okay. Um, the next text, number two, it, it, Mark, that's an image, and it's the image I've named this lecture series over, you know. Compassion as metanoia as opposed to paranoia. Okay? Mercy as metanoia, not paranoia. Okay. These are the first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospels, um, in, in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the very first word that comes out of Jesus' mouth when the Gospels are written in Greek is the word metanoia, which we translate in English, and I think we translate badly, but we don't know how else to do it. But we say, repent. Remember, it just said, Jesus began his ministry, he said, repent and believe in the good news. Now, in English, that just doesn't do justice to the text. Why? Because in English, the word repent, if I say to you, repent, what comes to your mind? Well, what comes to your mind is that you've already made some mistakes. See, you repent of mistakes. You've done something wrong and you repent. The prodigal son, he repented and went back to his father, you know. That's not so much what the Greek word means, okay? And I give it to you in Greek for two reasons, because first of all, we're going to punt it with the word uh, metanoia, um, uh, paranoia. But if you look at the word metanoia, you, you will see there that if, if you put a slash after meta, that's two Greek words. Meta is the Greek word for above. And we, today we use it in English. You know, you have a, a meta-narrative and a meta-this and we even got a basketball player now called Meta World Peace and so on. <laughs> but Meta simply means above, okay? And Noia comes from the Greek word nous, which is the Greek word for mind, you know? See, in Greek word, the Greek word for mind is nous, okay? And so, literally, the word means above mind or a higher mind. Now, I'm going give, to give this word to you. The church fathers used to do some wonderful commentary on this. The church fathers said that what Jesus, if you take Jesus' teaching and his miracles and so on, and the common denominator is that he's always calling you to a higher place, to a higher mind. So I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if you look at the miracles of Jesus, you know, the physical miracles where he heals people, I should say the healing miracles. Notice most of the miracles, and, 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 and Jesus never does these miracles to show off or to prove God's existence. Remember, every time they say, do a miracle to show your God, he doesn't do it, you know. He'll do miracles out of compassion or he'll do miracles out of revelation, okay. But a lot of the physical miracles have to do with a number of things, with the eyes. There's a lot of healing of blind people with the ears, opening up ears, you know, with opening the mouth so they can speak, with people who are lame and crippled so now they can walk, or with giving women their, their fertility back. That's the famous miracle of the woman with the hemorrhage. You know, whatever that hemorrhage was, she couldn't bear children. At the same time, he's on his way to raise the daughter of Jairus, so it just reached the age of puberty. You know, these are two women who could not give birth. One was dead and the other, her, her ability to give birth was dead. God restores that to him, so see, it's, he gives you back your fertility the eyes, the ears, and so on. And notice Jesus never takes an appendix out. It's just that uh, <clears throat> there's none of this surgery, you know. No, because these miracles are symbolic, and they always mean more than just the physical. See, Jesus opens eyes, not just so you can see, so now you can see more deeply. Now you can see the work of God. He opens your ears, so now you can hear more deeply. You can hear God's word. He opens our mouths, so now we can praise God. He gives, you, he gives us the ability to walk. So now we walk in the light of God. He gives these women back their fertility. So now they can give birth. They can be generative people on, on the planet and so on. But notice all the miracles have an extra. It's always to something higher. So the, the Greek church fathers and the Latin church fathers, they have this simple little expression, and I like it, to explain metanoia. They say all of us have two minds. See, metanus. They said each of us has two minds that inside of each of us, there is a big mind and there's a big heart. And inside of each of us, there's a petty mind and a petty heart inside the same person. So we all have a big heart, 
we all have a petty heart. We all have a big mind, we all have a little mind. Now this isn't abstract. He's not talking in Jungian terms if there's Jungians in here and so on. Not that Jung is wrong, but it's this. If you go, if, if, just all of us in this room, if you do just an inventory of our actions and our feelings on any given day, you'll know which mind or heart you're in, you know? So imagine this. You get up some morning. So it's, I don't know what happens during the night. Some days we get up and we're up. And some days you get up and you think you've, somehow you had broken glass during your sleep and you know, you're out of sorts with the world. But imagine you get up some morning and you're feeling good, you know? And you know, that morning you're Mother Teresa, you're Jesus, you could love the world, die and so on. And then you go to a meeting and somebody makes a caustic remark and two minutes later, you're gonna kill somebody and so on. Now, which of those two people is you? The big person or the petty person? The whole person or the wounded person? Well, they said, they're both you. Depends which mind you're acting out of. So all of us have a big mind, a big heart. So you get inside of yourself, there's a Mother Teresa, there's a Jesus, there's a saint inside of all of us. And inside of us, there's also a wounded, petty, selfish person. And different triggers to put you in this mind or that mind. See, so metanoia, Jesus is saying, go to the big mind. Operate out of the big mind. You know, don't, don't get into your wounds and pettiness and where your wound is. Get into the big mind, you know. And then, notice this, believe in the good news. But you could even say, get into your big mind and trust that it is good news. It's interesting. You know, we sometimes forget the word gospel. <clears throat> the word gospel doesn't mean good advice. It means good news. You know, the, the gospel isn't the teaching. That's true. We often think, oh, this, is, this is good advice. It is good advice. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is... The, the good news, that's what the word gospel means. You know, believe, get into your big mind, get into your big heart, operate, and see, so when Jesus heals, he's healing also to get him with the bigger eyes, the big, the big, the deeper hearing, the bigger heart, the, 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 the legs that you walk in, in the light with, and so on. See, so that's the first part. The word metanoia, to, to get into the big heart, the big mind, okay, notice that's very much richer than just the word repent, you know? You know, to say, get into what's highest inside of you, and it's inside of you, and operate out of that. Don't operate out of your wounds and pettiness and so on. But then also, part of that, that's why I give you the Greek word, it's also in Greek a pun against the word paranoia, which we have in English. So it's a Greek word. And paranoia is precisely, you, 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 you're, you're, we know what the word paranoia means, you're trying to defend yourself. Okay, Henry Nouwen, the great spiritual writer, this was his very first spiritual book in English. He wrote back about 1970, the University of Notre Dame. He wrote a little book, if you can still find it, it's a powerful, wonderful book, you can read it in two hours. And it's called With Open Hands. And in it, this one simple image. Henry Nouwen says, there's two ways that we can go through life. Okay, he said, we can go through life in a posture of metanoia, or we can go through life in the posture of paranoia. And he illustrates them. He said, paranoia, the image of paranoia is a boxer with the clenched fists. <laughs> See, you, you can go through life where we're unconsciously always defending ourselves. You know, you know, people are trying to take advantage of me and don't be naive and so on. See, it's all paranoia. I'm always defending myself. He said, or you can go through your life with a posture of metanoia, and metanoia is the posture of Jesus on the cross. He said, look at Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross, he's stripped of his clothing, his hands are out, his hands are open, and there's nails through his hands. That's trust. See, that's ultimate, that's metanoia. You know, it's the opposite of paranoia. So that, um, those of you who read C.S. Lewis and read um, some of his, his uh, particularly, you know, more, more specialized spiritual books like The Great Divorce and so on, You'll see how often he says in there, just to go, get to heaven, you have to trust. You, you don't get to heaven by being, and if you, if you haven't ever read the book, The Great Divorce, get it and read it. It only takes a couple of hours. And C.S. Lewis, it's a piece of genius. And he, he imagined, he fell asleep, and he has a dream that he died, and, and, and he's, 
He's on the plateau between heaven and hell. And he's there with other people. And all these angels come from heaven. And they try to talk the people into going to heaven. And only one out of ten actually goes. <laughs> and the others don't go because they, they distrust. You know, well, they must, you must have an angle. And, you know, how do I know what's behind that curtain and so on? You know, this, the, the saints keep saying, just... Just not, no problem. Go to, just give me your hand. I'll lead you in there. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I trust you. So see, that's, that's paranoia. You know? See, believe you can trust. You know? And that's the first word. That's, that's the, the gospel overture. You know, Jesus, that's the whole gospel. Metanoia. Not paranoia. You know? Go to the big mind and so on. See? And from there, you're going to see that's where mercy comes from. When we're at our best, we're merciful, women and men. When we're, not, when we're not at our best, we're paranoid. It's really true. And we, it, it can happen on the same day, you know. None of us are completely redeemed. We're still practicing Christians. <laughs> that means we're, we're practicing. Yeah. See, and on a given day, we can go through metanoia, paranoia, where some, sometimes when you're on top of your game, if I can use that expression, you're a saint. And then five minutes later, you feel insulted or something, you know, uh, doors start closing inside and slamming, and pretty soon um, you want to slam somebody. You know, it's the same person. You know, Jesus said, "Go to the big heart, go to the big, the big mind, and so on." That's metanoia. Okay. Then, this may be my favorite text in Scripture because it's so brilliant. That's John chapter eight. Mercy is not applying strict justice, or not stoning other people. Um, with God's commandments. That is that wonderful story in John's Gospel of the woman caught in adultery. Um, and uh, you're all familiar with that story. You know, a little bit of background about John's Gospel. You know, we have four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We call the Synoptic Gospels. And there, even though there's differences, there, there, there's, there's a lot of similarities. It's the same kind of a Gospel. And they write up the very simply, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they write up Jesus from the point of view of his humanity. So he's a human being who also happens to be God. Okay? John's gospel is very different, and it was written much later. Okay? And it's written up from the point of view of Jesus' divinity. See, he's a God who happens to take on human flesh. So the gospels, they're very different in that sense. So in John's gospel, Jesus has no humanity whatsoever. You know? Um, from the very first line, John says, In the beginning it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word becomes flesh. So in John's Gospel, Jesus is God, he comes down from heaven. You know? And actually, to the smallest detail, John says, he said to Philip, How many loaves and fish do you have? John has in brackets, he already knew. <laughs> God, there are no gaps on God's radar screen and so on. And notice in the other Gospels, <clears throat> Simon of Serene carries Jesus' cross. In John's gospel, he carries his own cross. God doesn't need help from us. Or in John's gospel, they come to arrest him. They said, Jesus stood up. They all fell over. <laughs> okay, see, the, the, you're, you're dealing with God. Okay, now, so here you're dealing with God. It's a wonderful text. And John's gospel, all of the gospel, it is rich symbolism overlaid with other symbol with other symbolism and other symbolism. And you'll see it from this text. Okay, great text. John says, one day Jesus was by himself. It's going to be the first hint. It's already a motif there. Jesus was by himself, and a crowd brought a woman to him. And they stood the woman in the center. And they said to Jesus, we have caught this woman in the very act of committing adultery. Said, And Moses said to stone women like that to death, what do you say? They said, Jesus was bent looking at the ground. He's not looking at the woman. Okay. And Jesus says to them, what, um, what did Moses say? They said, Moses said, women like that should be stoned to death. They said, Jesus was bent, and he began to write with his finger on the ground. And he looked up and he said, let the one without sin cast the first stone. Then John said, and he bent down and wrote with his finger again. John said, then they all walked away one by one. They put their rocks down. They walked away one by one. Then Jesus looked up at the woman. He said, woman, has no one condemned you? She said, nobody. So he says, go. <clears throat> Very important verb. He said, go. And don't sit anymore. Okay. Let's take that from the beginning. 
First of all, that Jesus was by himself. Now, that's already a motif in Scripture. In the Gospels, and a crowd brings a woman to him. Scholars will tell you that in the Gospels, crowds are almost always bad. <laughs> okay. They say, when you have the word crowd, you can add the word mindless. See, crowds don't have a mind. See, when you're alone, you're most, more sober, more somber, more reflective. When you're the crowd, you're an idiot. You know, it's really true. See, we get caught in crowd energy, and crowds do really stupid things, you know. Uh, we get caught in ideology and hype and this and in hysteria and so on. So crowds are dangerous. Jesus always feared crowds, you know. So a crowd brings it. So the, Jesus is reflective. He's by himself. The crowd is in hysteria. They bring a woman and they set her in the middle. So they're shaming her. See, she can't get her back to any wall. See, so they, they surround her. So that means she's being shamed. They're all looking at her. So they're, and, and the whole image is they're, they're holding her in her sin. See, they're surrounding her. So they're holding her in her sin. They're shaming her. And they say to Jesus, we caught her in the very act of committing adultery. So she's guilty. It's not a question here. You can also ask, where's the man? But that's another question. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, they said, and Moses said to, st um, to stone women like that uh, to death, you know. Um, pardon me, Jesus, what did Moses say? Moses said to stone her to death. Um, wait a minute. I got this text. No, it's it. Um, yeah, they said, and Moses said, I, I, I'm mixing this text up right now with uh, um, another text in Scripture, but let's, let's get to it. They surround her. They said, Moses said to stone women like that to death. What do you say? And Jesus didn't say anything. They said, instead, Jesus bent down and began to write with his finger in the ground. Now, that's very significant. Well, what's the image of Jesus writing with his finger in the ground? Now, he wasn't doodling, you know, and so on. No, no, that's a very significant picture. It's significant. Remember, in John's gospel, Jesus is God. Who writes with his finger in the ground? God does. And God writes with his finger in the ground twice. And it was with Moses. See, Moses went up the hill, and God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger into stone. Moses brought the commandments down, and as he comes to the camp, he catches the people in the very act of committing idolatry. There's only one vowel difference. Okay. So what does Moses do? This is the great pun in John. Moses breaks the Ten Commandments. Moses was the first person to break the Ten Commandments, except he broke them physically. He, he broke the Ten Commandments over the golden calf, and then he threw the stones at the people. See, so Moses, <laughs> the great pun there. Moses was the first person to break the Ten Commandments. Then he stoned the people with the commandments. See, he broke the commandments over the golden calf. He took the stones and threw them at people. Okay. Now, then Moses had to go back up the hill to get them written a second time. <laughs> but before God writes them a second time, he gives Moses a strong lesson. He says, I'm a God of mercy. Don't do that. Don't use the commandments to stone people, which is exactly what they were trying to do. Okay. So with his, Jesus, the two gestures, he's telling the people, Moses, he's the first person who got it wrong. He got it wrong, and he got scolded from God for it. God said, I'm a God of mercy, and don't take the commandments and stone people with the commandments. Okay? And to their credit, they get it. They all laid down their stones, and they walked away one by one, beginning with the eldest. Notice they came as a mindless crowd. They walk away reflectively and so on. Then Jesus turns to the woman. Notice he hasn't looked at her yet. Why not? That's a, that's a powerful motif in Scripture. God never looks at us in our shame. See, even with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned that they couldn't hide their shame, so God even gave them skins to hide their shame. See, God doesn't look at us in our shame. That's the act of mercy. You don't look at people in their shame. Okay. Now that the woman is no longer shamed, then God looks at her. Okay, and he says, as nobody condemned you, she says, nobody. Then he says, go. Now, it isn't just the scene is over. That's the word that's used when they release the Israelites from Egypt. Let my people go. He's saying to this woman, it's not that the scene is over. I'm releasing you into a new freedom. See, mercy doesn't just say, well, you've escaped the guillotine here. Say, no, mercy says... <laughs> You've escaped the guillotine, but you walk away into a new freedom. See, she's going to walk away through the Red Sea to the Promised Land, you know. And he said, don't sin anymore. And actually, the, 
the Greek expression there is, and don't miss the mark. Don't try, don't miss the mark the second time, you know. Now, there's a second background to the text that's very important here too, God's mercy. John makes it clear in this text that the woman is guilty, but you know something? It doesn't matter. See, again, God's mercy goes to the guilty and to the not guilty at the same time. Now, there's two backgrounds to this text in the Old Testament. One is Moses stoning the people with the commandments, you know. The other one is the, the famous story of Susanna in the book of Daniel. Remember the story of Susanna? In the, in the book of Daniel, there's the story of this, this young woman. She was very beautiful. She used to be out at, out at night in the moonlight. She'd take a bath and display her nakedness and her beauty. And you have these two men, you know, who lust after her, okay, voyeurs. Okay, so they proposition her, but she turns them down, so they accuse her of adultery. Now, she's being led away to be stoned to death by the law, the same as this woman here, when young Daniel is filled with the Holy Spirit. You can read this in the book of Daniel, okay? And he says, I'm innocent of this woman's death. So this is what he means, that pull those two men apart. So he gets them under two different trees. He said to the first man, you saw her commit adultery under which tree? He said, the oak tree. He said, fine. The other one, he says, um, which tree is it? The mastic tree. Then they realized the men were lying. So then they released Susanna, and then they killed these two men. They get stoned to death. Okay. Now, you won't have that story as a background. There's some very important points here. See, first of all, it, mercy doesn't go out to the innocent and not to the guilty. It goes out to the guilty and the innocent alike. This woman has what anthropologists call structural innocence. See, structural innocence is not the same as, as, as pure innocence, you know. See, structural innocence means whenever you're standing against the crowd, you are structurally innocent. So as an example, you know, imagine the old days and the Ku Klux Klan accuse a young black boy of stealing a horse and they take him out and lynch him. Does it much matter whether he stole the horse? You know, see, he's structurally innocent, whether he stole the horse or not. See, this woman... When you hear this story, where's your sympathy? With her, you know? It doesn't matter whether she's guilty or innocent, you know? You know, mercy has to do both. Now, I'll tell you why that's important. I'll give you an example. You know, we're supposed to be pro-life, but pro-life in every way, you know, which means against abortion, but also against capital punishment. So some people say, whoa, while well, these, these the abortion, these kids are innocent, this guy's guilty of murder. It doesn't matter. <laughs> See, uh, this woman was guilty. It doesn't matter. God's mercy goes out to the innocent and the guilty alike. So John wants you to get this. You know, incidentally, a great story on this. I want to tell you a story. See if you can pick up the irony in this story. Okay, stoning people for God. It's the story of Captain Cook. Captain Cook wasn't a Disney character. Captain Cook was a real English explorer. And he was an anthropologist, he sailed the world, and one time he stayed in the Polynesian Islands for about three or four years. And he learned the language, he lived with the chief, tried to learn the customs of the people, and so on. And one day, there were animus. And one day, the chief took Captain Cook to witness a human sacrifice. So they killed the guy on an altar for God, or the gods, whatever they worshipped. And Captain Cook was horrified. He wrote in his diary, he said, I was horrified. He said, I told the chief, you're a primitive people said, in England, we'd hang you for that. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you caught the irony. We call it capital punishment. They call it human sacrifice. See, you're killing somebody for God. Okay. They were going to kill this woman for God. Mercy says no, no, and no. Uh, see, you never do. And, and notice even, when, the, when that's pointed out to you, you'll always notice it how different Jesus is even from the Jewish scriptures. Notice in the book of Daniel, the innocent woman is saved and they turn the wrath of the crowd against the two men and these two men still die. Notice how this story ends so different. Nobody dies. They all just go home very somber and more reflective. See, with Jesus, no violence. You don't do violence in God's name. And always remember, Moses was the first person to break the Ten Commandments. And Moses stoned people with the commandments. Incidentally, the year of mercy was promulgated by Pope Francis. 
Pope Francis is very, very, um, this is one of his favorite texts. And Pope Francis says, sad part, he says, so many of us are sincere. He said, we would be standing with this crowd. We're still doing it. We're still trying to stone people with the commandments. We're judging people. We're not people of mercy. You know, those people standing around this woman, they were the sincere religious people of the time. They weren't bad people. They just had bad religion. Notice, you can be a very good person and just have real bad religion. These were God-fearing men and women. Jesus came from the school of the Pharisees. Those were the scribes and Pharisees were the religious people of the time. They were sincere, you know. They weren't bad people. They had bad religion, you know. And uh, you're going to see good religion is a religion of mercy. You know? th th this text from John is just one of my favorite texts. Uh, part of the reason is because you can sound brilliant when you explain it. Okay? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's all really in the text. But you also see John's depth, the symbolism and symbolism on top of symbolism and so on. And with John's gospel, every time you think you've got it, there's another layer, and there's still another layer. If you don't believe in the inspiration of scripture, just read John's gospel. Human beings can't set this thing together like that.